listening. Hallelujah. It's worship time. Are y'all ready to worship? Let's everybody go ahead and stand. We'll get ready to start our evening service. Listen. Come up to the altar. Come up to the altar. Let's worship together. Can we get the people on this side? Come on. Everybody come up front. We're going to worship together. Move your seat. Move your seat. Move your seat. Come on, guys. Come on. Everybody come up. Everybody start. Uh, and everybody start praying. Let's just start praying. Let's just start praying. Father God, we thank you for this night, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for this worship service that we're about to have, Father God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, just for being our source tonight, Lord God. Lord, we come to worship you, Lord God. We want to adore you, Lord God, and we want to just give your name praise. Father, we lift you up in this place, Lord God, because you're worthy of the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you feel, I don't, I don't, you know, there's nights like this. You know, this morning is a little hard. We have a meeting this afternoon. We, but you, you just feel, I don't know, you just feel the love in here tonight. The, just the power of God, the love. And you see tears of joy. And, you know, that's what it's all about. Communication, prayer, and believing God. We're going to go ahead and receive our evening offering tonight, our tithe offering tonight. And I kind of briefly mentioned that tonight. Um, in September, late September, we will be going back to Nairobi, Kawa West, with Abba Gospel Church. And I know that some of you may have a desire to go, may not get to go this time. And there's some I've asked to go that can't go. But I'm just, I'm a, I want you to trust me on this. I'm going to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And the ones that, that need to go this time will go. But I'm going to build a team, and we'll go there every year. But I'm not going every year. I will send a team to go over there and help and assist and do great things. So I'm believing God for that. And, I, and, and we can't get there without your support. And how many of you believe in taking living way outside to other countries and other, other places? And we're going to take ladies with us this time. Amen. My wife is going with me. I'm excited. <laughs> I was in, we were in the room the other night, and she said, what are we going to do this fall? And I was like, uh, we're going to Africa. And she said, oh, uh, not me. I said, well, the Holy Ghost said you're going. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave it up to him. And then some of you other people stepped in. And, you know, there's power in number, and there's power in, I believe God is always on time. He never misses it. And, and I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. How much that we, me and her, love all of you. And I wish we could express it maybe in a better way sometimes. And sometimes being parents, we're like parents to you. It's tough love and you think, well, they don't like me no more. But we really do. We really love you. And we thank God for every one of you. Your sacrifice, your time, your time away from your family. I don't want you to ever think that it goes unnoticed. Every bit of it goes noticed by us and by the kingdom of God. You guys are, all of you are wonderful from the youth team all the way back. You are some of the most dedicated people. But let me tell you this. I want to say this. I push you because the Holy Spirit is pushing me because we got to get to a place where God wants us to go. And, and I'm, I, I wish it was easy. I wish it was. I wish it was. I wish we never had trouble. We never had anything. But I told you through irritation and conflict is the gateway to our next destiny. And you know what? We're going to get there. So I want you tonight, if you got your... We'll ask the ushers to put the buckets out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and receive our offer, evening tithe offering. And I said this tonight. Some of you, I see you complain about money. You complain about your paycheck. You complain about everything else. Listen to me. Listen to me carefully. Till you begin to learn how to sow and you give your first fruits to God, I don't care if you make a billion dollars, you will still be broke. How many, how many billionaires you know go broke? They do. Have you ever heard about people winning the lottery? And then, then if a year later they ain't got none left, or these football stars or rap stars or rock stars, they have all this money, now they're broke. You know why? They didn't give their first fruits. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't understand the, 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 the season of sowing and, and, and reaping. And I don't care if you made four cent last week, whatever 10% of that is, what you need to give. Amen. If you made a dollar, give 10. I remember there was a lady here used to be our Bible college uh, dean. Y'all remember Elaine Stead? She didn't have a job. 
and her husband gave her a certain amount every week. It was like an allowance. You know, here's your allowance. And she, she didn't have no money. But she would give that little bit that she had every single week. And, and it, over a period of time, God elevated her to a place where she is today. So I'm telling you, be obedient to God. Trust God. I would tell you this, pay your tithe before you, you know, your mortgage. Your mortgage will always work out. Pay it before you pay your car payment. It will always work out. Pay it before you pay your light bill. It will always work out. Amen. You try to reason with God, it won't work. But be obedient. Just show him. God, we just thank you, Lord, for the offer and the ability to give. God, we love to give. And, God, we love to reap the benefits of it. God, we believe in sowing and reaping, and we believe, God, we're seeing the results of that today. We thank you, Almighty God, for your presence. We thank you, God, for the ability inside of us. We thank you, God, for these ones that are rising up, these instructors that, that you're giving words to tonight. I know we got Christine and Sister Christina that's coming up tonight to share a word with us tonight, and, and we believe in her. We've heard her teach. We've seen her ability in her, God. And, God, we've sat under the presence of the prayer team and seen the, the great things that they're doing in there. We pray, Almighty God, you bless her tonight. Bless this youth team tonight. Thank you, Lord. It's, it's good to see them back on stage and, and doing what they do, Lord. We just praise you. We honor you. I thank you, God. Let me just say this. I thank you, God, for my wife. And, and God, the great woman, the God that she is, and the love and compassion she has, not only for her family, but for this church family. And, God, I pray that, that, that these ladies will get behind her and lift her up and support her. God, because that love, you know, just goes both, back both ways. Thank you, Almighty God, for her, our family, our children. God, we pray your blessings upon this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Come on, fellas, help me move this thing. Razor, you want to get it? You want me to help you? All right. Somebody turn these stage light. Y'all give them a big hand. It's good to see our youth back up on stage. Amen. And, if you, and, and like I said, I'm, and if you got some kids that want to learn something, bring them up. We'll pray for them in the Holy Spirit, and we'll see the manifestation of God. So bring your tithe offering. Come on, do it quickly. Amen. A, a few weeks ago, probably a couple of months ago, uh, Christina came up to us, and, and, and she, she, uh, she had something she wanted to share, and I thought it would be really um, relevant to have it on a Sunday night one night. Uh, and let her share it. And she was going to do it last week, do the graduation, some other issues that came up. She was ended up being here anyway. Uh, we put it off. So, so um, we want to give her full attention tonight let her, and let her, let, her, let her say what's on her heart. And I want you to continue to get behind her, get behind this prayer team. Please come on Sunday mornings uh, and be a part of that. It sets the atmosphere. You feel so much better. You're already here. Uh, it's easier just to get into church when you do that. So everybody welcome Sister Christina. I don't know how to say your last name. God bless you, whatever it is. This is, <laughs> whatever. It's my cousin, Christina. Bless her. Amen. Well, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I came to Bishop Tim a couple of weeks ago, I had no idea, of course, what he was going to be preaching on this morning. And I was telling Pastor Stacy that a lot of the things that God had given me are just kind of a springboard of what an off of what he gave us this morning had I gave it last week he was talking about us being the gate of heaven but today he was talking about closing out the gate of hell and so this whole message is part of how you close out the gate of hell and so I'm going to share a little bit from my life so I'm being real <laughs> and I might have a few moments where you know um, we all know that we go through moments where sin temptation old habits old ways of thinking they try to come back and they try to you know they try to track us down you know but I'm going to talk to you tonight about how to avoid self-destruction a lot of times we give the enemy way too much credit when a lot of times it's our own flesh it's our own our own unrenewed mind that is keeping us from moving into the fullness that God has for us and so um I'm sure you guys have those scriptures back there. The first one's Romans 3.23. And I just want to establish, um, this is the one that says, All have sinned and come short of his glory. So there's not one of us in here that hasn't come short of the glory of God. And we all know that. But what happens to us a lot of times, we stay in that state. We stay in the I am a sinner state, and so I'm okay. I think he said this morning, like, it's my humanness. So then we stay in that state of mind. That's a different way of saying that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an excuse we make. 
And so God didn't give us this scripture as an excuse. He gave it to us so we would have an understanding of our need for a Savior. So that we would have, the, we would know that we need Him. And so um, turn to Ephesians 2.8. And it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not only of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So we know that even in our sin, because of the grace which came through Jesus, that then through our faith in Jesus, our belief in Jesus, that we're saved. So, And it wasn't something that we had to obtain, it was a gift. God gave it to us. So all we have to do is what? Receive it. Okay, I'm going somewhere with all this, so y'all just hang tight with me. Although Christ has given us grace through faith when we believed in him, he did not come to give us a license to sin, but the ability to walk free from it. You see, we, we see that as, well, you know, I can sin because I know God has grace, but he's not looking at it that way. He's looking at it as an empowerment. He empowered you to lay that thing down because of Jesus and because of his blood. But what happens with us a lot of times is after the enemy establishes a pattern of belief in our mind, then a lot of times he no longer has to keep pursuing us over the issue. Because what happens is, and I saw this in my life, um, just to tell you a little bit, I, I, I grew up, you know, in the country. You know, you always see me running around barefooted, and that's because the way I grew, that's the way I grew up. I can't stand having shoes on. You know, I grew up in the garden. You know, and I was always quiet. You can ask Bishop Tim if we were at a family meeting. I'm the one hiding behind my mom. You know, don't talk to me. You know, because I'm shy. You know, <laughs> you would never know. You would never know that I was shy, would you? And when I and when and I and I was scared of what people thought all the time. And I grew up in a Methodist church. First we were um, Baptist, and then we were Methodist. And it was very strictly religious at first. Then when I moved into the Methodist church, I went to the same one where he, Prospect, where he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And yes, and the pastor, although it was Methodist, he believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And many people, and the thing was, it was traditional enough in a way where people who were traditional would come but then they would still receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and so when I was 17 um, when I was 17 I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that changed my walk with God completely before that there was word and there was church and there was doing church activities but the power of God came on my life when I was 17 years old and I've always I got saved when I was five when I was little I accepted Christ and I've all my name means follower of Christ and so I've always felt that I've had that desire to follow God where some people just don't have that natural desire I did have a natural desire and so as I kept growing towards God though I started noticing that things would trip me up like everyday things because I grew up in a very unstable home environment and every time I would get to the end of just about finishing something, I would just self-destruct. I would just get right there, and then it, I just wouldn't complete it. And I kept, even with high school, I went all the way to the last year, and then I went to a school that, you know, didn't really even make you do work. <laughs> and I graduated from there, but I forfeited all that work of being in band and all the things of being a leader that I had built up. I was even a leader then. But I would get to the end and I would sabotage myself. And I kept asking God, God, why can't I finish the race? Why can't I finish the race? And so this is a message that has been building in me for 38 years. <laughs> so he's been showing me how to finish the race. Um, I taught a message in Bible college about finishing the race. And the story I told, of course, was about myself and how you're going to go through highs and you're going to go through lows. But you have to get up and finish the race. You can't stop. He said those who endure to the end are going to be the ones who receive the crown. You have to endure. You can't give up. And also there's a penalty for going back. Y'all remember that. There's a penalty for going back. So you want to stay. You want to stay in his grace through your faith. You want to stay there. Um, 
So we were talking about the enemy establishing a pattern. I began to notice that he was establishing a pattern in me, and it was from when I was little, and people would say, you know, uh, my brother was real good at picking on me. <laughs> You've met my brother. And he was, you know, you're too fat, you're too this, you know, always coming against me, always coming against me. Well, what the enemy will do in our lives is he'll take a lie. You think of it like this. That's the seed. And he'll take that one lie and he'll plant it. Then when it starts to grow, he'll send somebody else along to agree with the lie. You know, say a friend comes along, oh, you're fat. Okay, we're going to go with that one. What starts happening is a stronghold starts getting built around this lie. Y'all know how the Bible talks about strongholds. Then, next thing you know, you got a fortress around this belief in your mind. The enemy no longer has to come tell you that you're overweight or you're fat or you're not worthy because of that because you already believe it. You begin to see everything through the eyes of that belief. So even when somebody tries to come show you love, you won't accept it because you believe that you're that thing. And that's what began to happen to me in my life. And then what happens is, is your behavior will then begin to line up with what you believe about yourself. And even though I got the inside of me struggling with me, telling me I want to go this way, I want to do the right thing. Because I told you, I had an innate ability to want to do the right thing. But I got my flesh telling me, you're not good enough to do the right thing. You're not good enough, Christina. And so I had to keep battling that and battling that and battling that. And so I started to ask God, God, why am I in a pattern of self-destruction? Why am I taking myself out every time I'm right about to the place? And why do I see myself doing the same things? <laughs> over and over. And you can get frustrated with yourself. I know you're probably thinking of something in your mind right now that you've done the same thing over and over, and you're going, why did I do that? And it's because there's a stronghold. There, and the stronghold, the stronghold is centered on a lie that you believe. All right. What we believe about who we are in Christ has a direct effect on where we will go in our lives. So it's about identity. The enemy wants to come and steal your identity. And y'all have heard this from Bishop, but I'm just sharing this with y'all too, that, that you've got to know who you are in Christ. Because then, when, and how do we do that? We know that by the Word. The Word tells us who we are in Christ. And also the voice of the Lord speaking to us and telling us those loving things. So... All right. So ultimately, the goal of the enemy is to destroy the life of the believer. It says he came to steal, kill, and destroy. So that is the goal that the enemy has in mind. Um, that's John 10, 10, if you'll put that up there. This scripture right here just spells it all out for us. What God's plan and what the enemy's plan is. <laughs> the thief comes not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy... And then Jesus combats that with, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So I don't think in my life that running around in circles was abundant life. I wasn't finishing what I started. I wasn't completing a task. And in the end, I was feeling even more worthless, right? Because I'm not fulfilling my destiny. So... The enemy wants the effect of the cross to be null and void in our lives. He wants us to forget it's already done. So what he does is he takes that lie and he exalts his lie. You get that? You can see that in your life? He'll exalt that lie. The first thought that comes to your mind is not the truth, it's the lie. That's how you know he's exalting the lie above the truth. And he likes to remind us. <laughs> Every chance, because all he has is suggestion. That's why he wants to remind you so much. All he has is suggestion. But God, on the other uh, on the other hand, came to give us life and life abundantly. The enemy knows that this is finished, so he will use temptation, division, instability in the thought life to create patterns and behaviors in us that are driven by fear, 
which is insecurity and doubt. So how many things do we choose to do just because we're afraid to do the right thing? How many things do we choose to do? Like, God gave us a word to go give somebody, but we're afraid to do it because we're insecure about, because all that root I was telling you about in the beginning was all about insecurity that had been developed inside of me. And here God's saying, you're going to step out in a ministry that not many people do. People will come against the prophetic. You're going to step out in that ministry, the little girl who doesn't want to talk in front of anybody, but I'm going to tell her she's going to get up and talk. And then she's going to have to deal with learning how to not be insecure in herself to know that it's not her, it's God. That it doesn't matter, even if somebody did think something, it doesn't matter because it's not her, it's God. Because in the end, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what God thinks about you. It matters what God says about you. And the minute I started getting that down inside of me, I started realizing, well, you know, when the Holy Ghost hits me, somebody might not like it, but it's okay because when I go home, I can feel Father saying, you did what I asked you to do. And that's where we got to get. We got to get to a place where insecurity will not keep us from stepping out because that's ultimately what the enemy was trying to do was keep me from stepping out. Another thing was when I came here, you guys gave me a platform to step out. You didn't completely understand what God was doing in me. I probably looked crazy to even you, but you trusted God enough to allow me, and we have to do that in others. So let me step back and see what they can really do. Let's step back and see if there's really any fruit there before we judge. Because we don't remember, see, that judgment was that same person coming to me saying, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. And instead of building me up, they were tearing me down. And a lot of them were in the body. And that's what we do to each other. That's, and most of it is lack of understanding. It's just lack of understanding. So in that case, we just step back and say, God, what are you doing in this situation? Sometimes we might want to say, Lord, is that you or is that the enemy? He'll tell us. We don't automatically assume it's the enemy. Sometimes God will take situations and and deal with them in such a way for the good, for the good of that person. He's a father that will correct. Let me say that there. He is a father that will correct. And that's the same way that sometimes correction is needed. I felt today that as though we were talking in the leadership meeting, just the air was just cleared. And it was just out of us talking and making corrections in love. We were doing it all in love. And it just cleansed the atmosphere. All right. I've got some good stuff for (laughs) y'all. All right. If we don't know who we are, we will believe the enemy when he comes to tempt us to doubt God and doubt our position because sometimes we can get past the belief in God then we start doubting ourselves but God doesn't want you to walk in self-doubt either there's a lot of self things that we do that are self-inflicted they're self-inflicted then what happens is when we start doubting God we start doubting our position then we become lazy Well, since I'm not sure that's God and I'm not sure that I should do that, then I'm just not going to do anything at all. Well, that's the exact place he wants you to get in. He was just trying to get you off your post. And if he can accomplish that, then he's done his job. I was saying we can become lazy and conform or we can take God at his word and we can defend our stance. So instead of stepping back and becoming lazy, we said, no, I'm going to stand still and I'm going to trust God. The victory of an overcomer is one who knows his position in Christ. 
you can overcome every every challenge that you have. There's not one. He didn't say there was one that was too big, one that was too small. The last time I looked, it said nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible for those who what? Believe. See, we got to get to the core of what we believe about who we are. Because if we know who we are, then when the enemy comes to challenge us, we won't take in every little thing he's saying to us. We won't take offense. We won't rise up. We won't, you know why? Because there's something inside of us that says, no, I'm just not who I am in Christ. And you know, when you come to offer me that fruit you're trying to give me that I shouldn't eat, I'm not going to take it because I feel the strength of God telling me that that's not who I am. And he will come. He's come to me. He's come to me. He will come. Satan wants to divide what's already been sealed. He's trying to take something that Jesus already sealed and he wants to pull it apart, but he cannot. The only thing he can do is hinder fellowship. He can hinder your fellowship with God. He, God never walks away. He never leaves you, but you turn because of shame, because of guilt, and misunderstanding. He knows it's already been sealed, so he wants to try to divide the believer from intimacy with the Father. So he's okay if you come to church. He's okay if you call yourself a Christian. But don't get intimate with God because that's, that's exactly what he wants is your intimacy. You can come in here, but if you can't find that place of intimacy with him, I want to encourage you tonight. I don't want you to leave without feeling that you're free to get in that place of intimacy with God tonight. So, lastly, I'm going to talk about some steps of how we can avoid self-destruction. Step one, <laughs> we must believe that God's word is the ultimate authority or we'll be tossed by every thought and belief that's presented to us. We have to know that God's word is the ultimate authority. Not um, when another thought comes along that, well, that could be it. No, God's word is the ultimate authority. God's word, secondly, God's word combats the lies of the enemy. So we know that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is what we use to combat the lie. Three, God's Word reestablishes truth within us, and it releases the power of God in us to have faith in the things that we've not yet obtained. So I don't feel free yet. I still say I still feel insecure. But I'm saying, Lord, I know by faith that you said when your Holy Spirit has come upon me, you'll give me, you'll cause me to be a bold witness for you. Now I'm standing on his word until I'm standing up being a bold witness. Until it's coming forth. The next thing you know, I'm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> off in the Holy Ghost and I'm not caring what anybody thinks. And it's, it's that place of stepping out of the lie and into the truth. We must establish ourselves in the Word of God as an immovable force. When I'm standing in the truth, I'm not shakable. Do you know when people tell lies, they have to tell more lies so that, you know, and when you're in the truth, you don't have that shakiness about you. When we're standing in the truth, we're an immovable force. You can't be shaken. And plus, you're standing in God. Think of it like that. When I'm in the truth, I'm in God. I'm clothed in his righteousness. I'm in his armor. I've got his armor from my head to my feet. You can't, you can't get through that. So step two is to recognize patterns, cycles of sin, and iniquity, and self-destructive behavior. And there is a difference between sin and iniquity. And iniquity is a sin that we habitually habitually commit and we... And we um, have an even harder time getting free from. It has a more established pattern within us. Um, so we need to begin to recognize those patterns. Think of something that you know that in your life you got free from this. You, say you even went and got prayer. We use that as an example. And for a whole week you felt free, but yet you didn't get down to the root or the lie of what got you into that position in the first place. Well, then what happens is, is the, old the old behavior will just fall back into place because you haven't yet dealt with, you haven't yet established the truth. We must uproot and throw anything 
in us that is not bearing fruit in the fire. That's what the Bible says. It says that he cuts away the dead branches and he throws them into the fire. So anything else that's not life-giving, we have to go in, we have to uproot those things. We also have to cut off those dead things and we have to give them to God. And the third step in walking free from self-destruction is we have to come out of the dark and into the light. We are to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. Anything we bring into the light will be exposed. So as long as we're in darkness, it's hard to combat the darkness, right? Because we're standing in darkness and we're trying to fight an enemy we can't see. But we got to bring the light of Christ into the situation. Outside the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, okay. Outside, this is really good. Some of you might want to write this down. It says, outside the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit, it is not possible for you to maintain freedom from sin. But inside of you, you have all power. And pull up Galatians 5, 16 through 20 for me. And this is a very familiar scripture, but... Galatians. Galatians 5. So once I've gotten free from this stronghold, I go in, I pull this thing out, I uproot it, I cast it out. How do I stay free from it? It says in Galatians, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go to the next one. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things you would. That right there just told me that if I'm not walking in the spirit, I cannot stay free from sin. I have to walk in the spirit. I can't do it under my own power. I can only do it by the power of the anointing inside of me. Go to the next one. But if you are led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. And then there's one more. Go ahead to the next one. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. And if you go to this scripture, there's a long list of all the things that I'm sure all of us could look and find ourselves in one of those categories there. But what, the, what they're saying here is that, is that to walk in the Spirit is the way that we avoid walking in the flesh and so as the Holy Spirit grew bigger inside of me and I, I received the Holy Spirit and it grew bigger inside of me I started to realize that I'm going to have to walk in the Spirit more well, why does she want to walk away and just go pray when everybody else wants to talk because you know what you're talking but all that's doing is making me feel stressed I want to go hear what God said because you know what, I've got to walk in the Spirit. Because if I tell you my opinion, before I go talk to the Holy Spirit, you probably won't get the best opinion. You'll get what I think about it. But if you get me while I'm... And we have to learn to continually be in that state. You know, I try now when somebody's talking to be listening to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you saying about this? Because He always has an answer. He always has an answer. And so what I started to realize is is that God wants us to be free. And I had a statement that I wanted to leave with y'all. It says, True freedom is not the absence of the authority of God, but possessing every attribute that is promised because of His authority. We try to be free from anything that tries to put some kind of boundaries on us. But God gave us boundaries for a reason. He gave us boundaries as our protection. When we don't like our authority, He gave us authority for a reason. When you tear down your authority, you tear down your own body. Because He created it, head, this represents the government, flows down to the body. And all these bodies represent an important piece of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. But when you start coming against the head, of course, is Jesus. But 
then you start coming against the government, which is also on the head. You're coming against the government. You're, you're coming against God's plan. Our freedom is not stepping out of the authority that God's given us, but it's learning how to live and walk in the Spirit within the parameters of the authority that He's given us. Tonight, when you guys come up for prayer, and I really want to encourage y'all tonight as we pray, that if if you heard something in this message that you said, that's me, I, I keep doing the same thing. I want you to come up here, and I want you to either just get in this altar and seek God, but if you feel like you need some help getting through something or over something, we've got prayer warriors up here, and I would love for them to come up And just help minister to you to help you get over those things that are stumbling blocks for you. It says in the word that he makes the crooked places straight. You always feel like you're trying to find the path. (laughs) He makes the crooked places straight. He's the one who does it. I'm just going to pray for a minute. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for each and every life in this room. Father, I thank you that right now, Father God, you're beginning to open up their heart. You're beginning to open up their mind. Father, the things that I might have missed to say, I thank you right now, Holy Spirit, you're depositing those things in them right this minute, speaking to them yourself. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you there's just a cleansing that's beginning to take place in this room right now. God, I thank you that we'll no longer walk in paths of self-destruction, Father God, but we'll learn how to walk in the Spirit. And Father, you will lead us into all truth. And I thank you for that, Father. God, right now I just release, I just ask you to release your heavenly angels right now, Father God, to begin to move about this room and to begin to minister to the hearts and the minds of these people here, God, within my hearing. God, and and God, I just pray right now, Father God, that you would just begin to envelop them in your love, Father God. And they would begin to feel a place, Father God, right now, even right there in their seat. They'd feel your love wrap around them. And God, even in that place, they begin to feel like they can let go of some past hurts. They can let go of some past things that have been said. Any shame, any guilt they might be holding on to, God, I thank you it's being released. Any unforgiveness, God, is being released right now off of them, Father. Any confusion they might have about you right now, Father God, I thank you that you are As they surrender it to you tonight, God, you're going to begin to lift it off and out and gone. And then they're going to begin to walk in your anointing. Christ the anointed one. I'm wearing Christ the anointed one on me. In the name of Jesus. Y'all go ahead and sing. I want to share one last thing with y'all. Because now I know why Holy Spirit showed me this this morning. The body has not only become passive, she's become passive aggressive. You know when a person becomes passive aggressive is when they're holding unresolved hurts and pains. And what happens is instead of outright lashing at somebody, they come across in hits that are, you know, not really direct. Passive aggressive. If you feel like sometimes people say things to you, And you want to deal with them harshly. You can't stay in that place of peace. I'm talking to you tonight too. I'm talking to you tonight too. Because God doesn't want his bride to be passive aggressive. He don't want her taking shots at each other. So if you feel like that's you tonight, just come on up here to the front. We're going to have someone minister with you. This is not about me. This is about you and God. And I came here tonight to tell you that he loves you with an everlasting love. And that he loved me even when I was dirty. 
He loved me when I was a 20-year-old girl with a little boy that I didn't know how I was going to raise. And he raised him alongside me. Whatever it is tonight, if you'll just get real with God, He's going to remove it. He's going to remove it. He shot ha ha ma 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 